My name's Freddie Myers. I'm a composer and conductor, and today I'd like to introduce you to bandwidth. One, two, three. Bandwidth is an internet-based ensemble that I created in April 2020, which explores the way that live chamber music can function within a networked environment, allowing players to perform together in real time from different places across the world. Bandwidth performs a wide range of musical repertoire. Part of our practice explores performing historical works, and these have ranged from the medieval period to the 20th century. We've also commissioned several new works from composers who've explored various ways that networked performance can change the way that we play together. While multi-track performances have been a great way to bring distance ensembles together, I was keen to explore how we can perform completely live online, focusing on making music in a different way without an emphasis on playing strictly in time with one another. We began experimenting with typical chorale textures and improvisation and really felt that there was something interesting and beautiful to be found in how music functions with latency, even if not in the traditional way that we're used to. Interestingly, we found that our experience and therefore our approach to rehearsing a performance changed with each different piece, and we'll look at a few of Baumert's performances later on. What has emerged is a drastically new performance context that is separate from both in-person live music and studio recordings. The main issue experienced with online performance is latency, which is the time delay between person A making a sound and person B hearing that sound. In video conferencing, this latency is partly caused by the physical distance between people and also by the processing of video data as it is routed through servers and rendered on screen. In a musical context, we're able to perceive latency when it is greater than about 20 milliseconds. If we were performing with musicians on opposite sides of the world, for example, between London and Melbourne, even if all data was processed immediately and took the shortest route at the speed of light, there would be a latency of 90 milliseconds, which is very easily perceptible. For me, this was a very important consideration in growing and developing bandwidth. At the beginning of the pandemic, we investigated several software options that offered negligible latency when used with performers who were geographically close by. However, unless we discover a way to communicate faster than the speed of light, live music over the internet between more distant parts of the world will always involve an element of latency. So rather than trying to work around latency, bandwidth tackles the problem head on, exploring latency's musical implications, like the way that it transforms creative authority and how it reframes perspectives for both performers and audience members. Let's view a specific example of the problem caused by latency. When two people are on a video call together, each person's experience is unique from the other due to their latency. So let's explore what happens when two people try to clap together. Here we have two members of Bandwidth, Emily Earle in London and Ruth Heaney in Manchester. Emily will count us in, with both her and Ruth aiming to clap on beat four. Ruth is following Emily as she hears her clap. And from Ruth's perspective, their claps occur exactly at the same time. However, from Emily's perspective, Ruth is significantly delayed. One, two, three. In order to counteract this, Ruth could anticipate Emily's clap, causing beat four to be together from Emily's perspective. One, two, three. However, this leaves Ruth unable to hear a synchronized clap at her end. As you can imagine, this has a profound impact on the music that we perform. Not only does synchronization become an impossibility, but also the exact timing of each player changes depending on where you are listening from. None of the players will hear the piece in the same coordination as an audience member, and this means that in our live networked performances, there are multiple unique musical performances which coexist. Perspective matters in a networked context, especially when multiple performers are working together. We found this to be an incredibly exciting element within bandwidth, as it encourages risk-taking from players who naturally have a level of uncertainty associated with what they're playing. Here is a short extract from one of our early transcriptions.
early days of Bandwidth, I arranged all the historical music that we played in order to guide performers through this unusual high latency environment. As you can see, the piece is split into two types of material. The first are moving lines, where timing is completely free, and the second are meeting points, where players can reconnect on a held note to roughly synchronise them. More recently, Bandwidth has started to perform historical music straight from the original scores, without any arrangement, and what we found is that this process of alternating between free sections and meeting points has become intuitive and can help lead us through a performance. As a millennial making music online, the first analogy that came to my mind is Slink from Toy Story. Everyone is connected, and everyone progresses between large musical structures at the same time. However, the details have a sort of elasticity, where no player is exactly in the same space at the same time. Essentially, what we end up with is a natural ebb and flow between players, which is malleable as they interact. In January this year, we released a performance of Sonata Prima Atre by Giovanni Battista Buonamente. The piece is originally written for two violins, with a wind instrument on the tenore part, and a keyboard instrument playing a figured bass part. As we didn't have access to period instruments, I thought it would be more interesting to play with the orchestration, and our performance utilised a bass clarinet in place of a bassoon, and a synthesizer instead of a harpsichord or an organ. We decided to perform this piece without arrangement, particularly as the manuscript only existed as a collection of parts without a score, and so vertical relationships would have originally been blurred. So with the, with the Buonamente, uh, it seemed like there were two challenges really to overcome. The first was um, sort of judging how much earlier I should be entering than what I was, what I was hearing. Um, but the second, as a continuo player for an improviser, was uh, choosing the right kind of material that both didn't rely on pulse and also didn't rely on syncing with, um, with the other musicians too much. So I kind of went for a lot of spreads, chordal spreads between the hands, um, and also sort of expressive counter melodies in the right hand, uh, with only that sort of the odd moment of block chords, just to outline the chords a bit more clearly. Unlike the masho that we heard earlier, which had clearly defined synchronization points, the buonamente was more complex and part of the rehearsal process involved going through the piece to find moments where more metric freedom could be allowed. Obviously, cadence points provided larger scale handholds through the piece, but even within phrases, there were moments where the players could choose to wait or anticipate. What emerged was a transformation of the original sonata, as if we were shining it through a type of musical kaleidoscope. For me, the most exciting part of this process is actually the moments where the music breaks apart and can't be made to work. In the section around bar 27, the music almost collapses and all sense of meter completely evaporates, making the resolution at the chorale texture at bar 32 all the more satisfying. to confront these challenges of timing head-on, Bandwidth is constantly forced to be innovative in the way that it performs music of the past. The process of fracturing musical experience is not actually all that novel. Most notably, Pieces which explore how music can exist within space tend to create multiple unique perspectives of the performance. Dating back to the 16th century, the antiphonal polyphony from San Marco in Venice juxtaposed musical material through its positioning in physical space. Similarly, a piece like Stockhausen's Grippen for three orchestras explores the effect of moving sound between the three separate ensembles. Many composers have also introduced temporal fluidity into their compositions. Here are two examples, the first from the opening of Lutoslavsky's Third Symphony, where individual players are given moments of metric freedom, and the second is from Charles Ives' Central Park in the Dark, which splits the ensemble into two temporal situations.
Though both these pieces create a fractured polymetric music time, neither particularly distorts the composition into functioning as multiple musics at once, but rather they exist as singular pieces that involve a type of fracturing that is contained within themselves. The disruption of the singular musical object is also evident in large-scale symphony orchestras of the late 19th and 20th centuries. Due to the increase in size of orchestras over time, players at the back would have to anticipate the conductor's downbeat in order to be heard in the same time at the stalls. The same is also true for socially distanced orchestras in 2021, who have to consider how they can play in regard to absolute timing when they are sitting farther away than usual. Physical perspective has ramifications in music making. When performing online, we're no longer dealing with differences in physical space, but rather the difference of place within time. This unusual temporal space that exists within these types of connected temporal frames is complex. In order to understand this better, I'll first explore the development of Cubist practices from the early 20th century, which explore a similar concept relating to the realms of multidimensionality. The development and exploration of perspective has been a feature of the histories of European art, and many techniques were developed to find ways to render the physicality of the world onto a single plane. Our world exists in three-dimensional space, which means it has length, width, and depth. The process of fine art involves taking a single viewpoint within 3D space and representing that on a surface that only has two dimensions, height and width. Across the 19th and 20th centuries, scientific discoveries developed more of an understanding of the implications of space outside our three-dimensional reality. These included explorations of higher dimensional space, so those that contain more directions than width, depth and height, non-Euclidean space, which involves curved and warped space, and the developments of Einsteinian space-time, which showed that temporality and space were intimately linked. It's worth noting that throughout this exploration into art history, there is no attempt at making a causal relationship between cubism and scientific ideas of space. As a 3D observer, we can understand 2D geometry in its entirety. If we were in 2D, we would only be able to see 1D shapes and would have to move around 2D objects to see them in their entirety. So extrapolating this concept, a four-dimensional viewer would be able to understand all of a 3D scene at once without having to change their perspective. A hallmark of Cubist artists is their use of multiple perspectives within a single artwork, which gives the effect of a 4D perspective on a 3D world. Here we can see George Brack's still life with glass and newspaper from 1913. Brack's still life captures a single three-dimensional scene However, the painting is constructed in a collage-like manner. Multiple three-dimensional perspectives are placed onto and between one another on a 2D canvas to create a scene that has within it multiple angles at once. Therefore, we can fully understand a 3D object and this gives us an access to an image from a higher dimension. In some ways, this process captures motion in space, showing Brack's movement around the object. However, as the name suggests, a still life cannot be a demonstration of temporality. Rather, Brack's painting approaches a perspective within four-dimensional space in his still life. Up until the 1980s, it was thought that artists had lost interest in dimensional concerns. In her seminal book, The Fourth Dimension and Non-Euclidean Geometry in Modern Art, Henderson wrote that during the 1950s and 1960s, artists such as Dali and Pereira were nearly alone in their continued interest in the traditional fourth dimension of space. This comment from the 1980s is interesting. After the book's publication came the age of computers, where dimensions once again became of interest to creators. In the reintroduction to the 2013 edition of Henderson's book, she writes, 1984 was the year in which William Gibson introduced the term cyberspace in his science fiction novel Neuromancer, and subsequently, the new availability of personal computers, increased graphics capabilities, and ultimately the internet would revolutionize visualization and communication techniques. The use of computers allows us to understand 4D concepts in a way not possible on paper. For example, an animation of a hypercube allows us to visualize it far easier than a drawing on paper. With computer games and digital spaces, we can also be placed in a virtual environment where spatial dimensions are warped. And there are several examples of video games which explore space outside of three dimensions. For example, the 2013 puzzle game Antichamber. 
In the same way that computers have revolutionized the way we understand spatial dimensions, internet video conferencing software has drastically transformed the way in which temporality can be understood in musical terms. In Cubist artworks, multiple perspectives from different vantage points in 3D were combined, ultimately producing an expression of the world from a higher reality. Bandwidth's process is the same, but rather than dealing in spatial dimensions, we deal in temporal ones. Each of Bandwidth's players exists in their own temporal perspectives, and these are combined to create a type of imaging of a hyperreality. I don't think it's useful to be prescriptive about this mapping, but Bandwidth's practice does reveal a new type of music making where each performer is simultaneously forced to take charge and also to follow. When performing under normal latent circumstances, these effects of multi-temporality are subtle. I wanted to explore this concept more overtly, and the product was my own composition for bandwidth called Night Meeting. The piece takes its title from a chapter in Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles, which describes an interaction between a Martian and a human on a desert promontory. Both believe they are in the present, and the other is a ghost from the past, and when they try to touch, their hands pass through each other. Inevitably, their position in time is left unanswered. My composition was scored for violin and cor anglais, however each player's sound is processed through a real-time speed shift patch in Max MSP. The violin is heard by the core player 75% slower and a perfect fourth lower, while also delayed by two seconds. The cor anglais is slowed down by 80%, heard a major third lower and delayed by one and a half seconds. In the piece, both players are required to respond to cues of each other, and the overall progression of the piece is determined by their communication. However, neither player actually interacts with the present version of the other. Rather, both the violin and the cor anglais perform alongside a ghost of the past. Night Meeting was very much an experiment into what could be possible when pushing the limits of networked performance, and what emerged was a piece whose materiality was uncertain. When we recorded the work last September, having each player plus their ghosts all in separate spaces meant that no one heard the piece in its entirety, so the final recording portrayed a performance that didn't exist in any one point in the real world. Bandwidth's practice will inevitably continue after restrictions on live performance are lifted, and we have international projects planned with players in Norway, Canada and the West Bank. Bandwidth presents a type of music making which is inherently environmental, allowing collaboration between countries without needing to fly, and allowing real live collaboration across borders that would not otherwise be possible. We're also interested in moving our practice to the real world and finding ways to perform to audiences across multiple spaces, whose own perspectives are limited to which venue they decide to buy a ticket for. Reveling in its juxtaposition of conflicting perspectives, perhaps bandwidth is more able to accurately represent the multiplicity of realities in the modern world.